Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we're going to give just another 30 seconds for folks to roll on in since we've just started the webinar. And in about 30 seconds, we will get going here. So grab whatever you need to get comfy um, and we'll get going. All right, it looks like people have rolled on in. So hello, if you are joining us for the first time, welcome to today's session on digital activisms in practice. Uh, we'll be hearing from a few of the contributors of our recent book, Networked Feminisms, Activist Assemblies and Digital Practices. We are really glad that you're here with us. Um, and if you're rejoining us from our first and second sections, welcome back. Uh, so thank you so much for coming again to our third speaker series session. Before we begin, I will go over just a few practicalities. At the bottom of your screen are two functions that I just wanna bring your attention to. So we've got the Q&A function, which is where you can drop any questions that you would like to ask our speakers for the Q&A portion at the end. Please ask questions. Some of the best questions that we'll actually ask today will come from folks in the audience. Second, we've got that closed captioning available for the series, and you can enable that through selecting the CC button to enable live captioning. We also have two ASL interpreters here with us today. To begin this session, I'll acknowledge that this speaker series is being held virtually, and it's hosted by folks from the University of Waterloo, the University of Windsor, and Mount Royal University. I am currently working from the University of Waterloo, and it's on the traditional territory of the Neutral and Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our main campus is situated on the Haldeman Tract, and that was land that was granted to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. Um, as I've said in previous sessions, acknowledging territory allows us to recognize the enduring presence and actions of Indigenous communities, peoples, and lands but more work towards reconciliation does have to follow. Right before our first speaker series in January, Cherokee scholar Joseph Pierce tweeted a set of questions that I want to return to today as we begin today's sessions, because we really believe that these are questions that can be applied as we work towards reconciliation. So Pierce asks us, what would it mean to consider relations, indigenous forms of reciprocity, care and knowledge, as central to the theory or to the teaching of theory? What would it mean, in other words, to relate across worlds as a method of political praxis that centers relational constellations? Um, and the link to Joseph Pierce's um, Twitter should be in your chat there if you want to take a look at it. And so these questions and the call to better understand connections and histories highlight two key themes that we've tried to embody with our speaker series here. That first theme is this deep commitment to relationality. And the second is a commitment to affecting change through agitation, through resistance, and through community building. And so today, as with our other two sessions, we're aiming to bring an overarching commitment to intersectionality and to bring together a range of experiences and standpoints that reflect these themes of agitation, of resistance, and community building. And so today we're really grateful to have Radhika Gajala, Sujatha Subramanian, and Leandra Hernandez here with us to talk about their work. And so we'll hear brief talks from our speakers on what it looks like to enact digital activism within two different contexts. And then after their presentations, we'll have a discussion with our panelists, moderated by Michelle MacArthur, and then followed by an audience Q&A portion, moderated by Milena Radzikowska. Uh, and so now, I will pass it over to my co-editor and co-host, Milena Radzikowska, to give us the bio biographies of Sujatha and Radhika. Thank you so much, Brie, and, uh, and welcome to our first two speakers. Uh, Sujata Sabramanian is a PhD candidate at the Department of Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at The Ohio State University. Her research interests include girlhood and youth studies, juvenile justice, and feminist media studies. She's also an editor with the Detention Solidarity Network. And also joining us is Radhika Kajala, and uh, she's a professor of media and communication, dual appointed faculty in American culture studies at Bowling's Green 
State University. She is currently the managing editor of the FemBot Collective. Her recent books include Digital Diasporas, 2019, and Online Philanthropy in the Global North and South, Connecting Microfinancing and Gaming for Change, 2017. She is currently working on a co-edited book on gender and digital labor. I really look forward to that. So thank you so much, and uh, I'm handing it over. Thank you. Sujata, you want to go first? Um, you could go first, and then I can. Sure. Um, I'll just quickly, um, I think I've been asked for uh, to talk about um, things for about 10 minutes, correct? So, um, yeah. Yeah. So thank you. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get to the main points. I've sent my main points uh, to the um, uh, accessibility services. Um, first, I think I've been asked about my research and um, my, I want to first actually I get to the text. I want to thank Brianna and the co-author, co-editors for making this possible. And I also want to thank, yes, thank you. And I also want to thank uh, Sujata and Vijeta for actually making this chapter happen. Um, and Sarah, who also is not here, but she also is a co-author. Um, this chapter happened, I would say, uh, because of work that uh, people like Sujata and Vijeta are doing, and there are several others doing this work in Twitter spaces, uh, but also because of work that a lot of Black Indigenous people of color are doing in, in uh, what might, to some people, not to us uh, women, uh, work uh, who are concerned with labor of women in home spaces and other spaces, be surprising is that there's a lot of activism going on in what is considered to be do it yourself hobby spaces and small entrepreneurial spaces around fiber crafting work. So I want to thank all these people for making this possible. Um, and I consider myself to be um, uh, somebody who's just bringing these concerns to um, the mainstream academic audience in a global north context. So I want to do that and say, kind of preface all everything I say with that. Um, first, um, I also want to say that um, what um, Brianna just uh, pulled up from Tebe Pierce's Twitter um, actually is very relevant to the kind of work I do because there is a constant uh, rupturing. Uh, I put a sentence out and ask for it to be broken apart and, and, and ruptured. And um, I am grateful again <laughs> to the people who actually come and take that seriously and start to ask me questions. So that, that is the essence of my methodology um, is I'm gonna say something and invite people to contest me and then we'll, we'll take it from there. Um, if you want the formal, uh, um, you know, presentation of what my work has been over the past, I would say, since maybe 25 years, um, has centered around communication, cyber culture, and globali globalization in relation to subalternity and modernization. Uh, my current projects, uh, as uh, was already mentioned, include uh, research on women's labor and craft communities in Indo India and Indonesia. These are physical spaces that I've been to, but I, I learned from the physical epistemologies there to bring to my research in digital spaces. So craft cultures in the global north and online uh, uh, spaces and an examination of gendered political subjectivities that emerge through digital publics. I wanna be clear that when I say gendered, I also include men because men are gendered whether they think they are or not. Um, so my early cis men, my early research began with examinations of email list archives and that's and USENIT bulletin board archives. And now I return to look at archives, but in social media and through computational data analytic tools to intervene critically in this process of receiving computational methods as given, um, which then takes us to kind of critiquing the quantitative uh, methods um, uh, used to flatten the epistemologies of speaking. I, sorry, I think I'm speaking very fast. Um, thus, I am currently working with a team of graduate student collaborators to develop 
ex and extend feminist approaches to the implementation of computational tools in digital humanities and social sciences. So this chapter um, in Network Feminisms draws from digital ethnographic work, textual analysis and interviews around both do-it-yourself, cyber cultures online, and uh, Indian feminist and anti-caste influencers and activists in digital publics. Um, this started with a conversation around what it means to be a brown woman in India, where we're all brown, <laughs> technically. So the issue was around uh, uh, the using, or in, and this was lean in India. So that sort of gives you a context for uh, what sort of a um, liberal uh, feminist or whatever lean and feminist uh, framework that comes from? It was a conversation that gave rise that that gave rise to questioning from the uh, activist Christina Thomas Dundraj, who is a, a consultant for for Absolute Woman fight and uh, at Smashboard, and uh, also a founder of the Dalit History Month. And her question was, what do you mean by woman of color? And what do you mean in India? Uh, the interesting thing for us, I think this had lots of conversations with uh, Sujata and Vijeta over this as well, and social correct me if I'm wrong. The interesting for thing for me was, Brown women in India, huh? And and I think what um, Sujata and Vijeta were also pointing to is like you, you people are willing to talk about brown and colorism, but not about issues of caste, which are integral to our historical uh, oppressions in 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 the Indian context, in the South Asian context. So caste. Um, um, you know, indigenous communities coming from what they would call the Adivasis um, and from, uh, uh, so all these are categories in India that would work better than, that feed into issues of colorism, but also would work better than calling ourselves, I'm a brown woman in India. So we were laughing about that and we were discussing this with fury and anger and irritation. And then Sujata, Vijeta, and Sarah kind of got together and said, let's write this because I was seeing something else going on in the uh, uh, Black Indigenous People of Color Fiber Crafters hashtag where people of color often care also connected who were from historically, you know, long time ago diasporas of South Asians as well. And some of these South Asians also come from histories of having come through the indentured laborers from pre, you know, and and so there's a combination of things that led to this. Um, I I'd ask you to read the uh, chapter and see the how it was a very difficult process trying to get it across. Uh, because uh, I must say that uh, the transnational feminist westernized academia wouldn't understand our what we were trying to get at. So it was very, very hard. So I, I thank the editors of the collection too for helping us make this possible. And I think Sarah worked very, very well with the three of us to try to help us <laughs> in this kind of a translation as well. Um, so the So in terms of, so that's basically it. I think we have other discussions that will come up later after our panel discussion. So I'm gonna stop there and let Sujata speak. Um, so to introduce myself, my current body of research um, looks at juvenile justice, but what unites the work that I've been doing with Dr. Gajala um, and my doctoral work are broadly three questions. Um, so the first question um, thinks about the idea of space. It thinks about um, taking seriously where we are located and how our location shapes um, our interventions or our claims to justice. Um, the second question is to think more broadly about justice and thinking particularly about how intersections of caste, gender, and sexuality shape our ideas of justice. Um, and the third question that um, sort of unites both these bodies of research is thinking about how transnational flows of power and especially transnational uh, you know, travels of theory and bodies of knowledge um, frame the conversations that are possible. Um, and I just want to begin by talking about how um, 
uh, for me, uh, the, con the, the process of having a conversation with Dr. Gajala was really productive. Um, and I think some of the questions that we look at in our chapter in terms of, you know, looking at how our standpoint kind of shaped the writing of the chapter um, and how our multiple locations uh, and our activist and academic engagements uh, shaped uh, the process of writing. Um, and here I'd just like to add that, um, so both of us are uh, located in the North American Academy and um, our very first conversation was just thinking about how uh, that location, our location in the North American Academy has shaped the kind of conversations we've been able to have around caste. Um, and like Dr. Gajla said, I think the initial conversations were about um, us expressing a sense of frustration um, and us expressing that uh, the kind of nuanced conversations around caste that we wanted to have were very often not possible within the structure and the limited space that the North American Academy was giving us. Um, and the reason behind this um, has a lot to do with how knowledge production um, around South Asia, around caste, around India, um, has taken place in the North American Academy, but also in academic spaces in India. Um, so uh, I think those are questions that we've tried unpacking in our chapter. We've tried looking at, um, you know, why is it that histories of caste or histories of gender-based violence as shaped by um, caste have not been part of uh, you know, the traditional curricula around say post-colonial studies or decolonial studies in the North American academy. Um, and I think related to the question of knowledge production is also the question of what it means to be in solidarity with each other. Um, uh, and I think the argument that we're trying to make is that uh, for coalitions to take place or for us to be in solidarity with each other, um, we need to interrogate these bodies of knowledge uh, that have come to become, uh, you know, dominant dominant bodies of knowledge, right? We have to question the erasures that have taken place, um, and uh, espe especially the erasures around uh, caste uh, that we see happening in the North American Academy. So um, our very first conversations were around that, um, and I think since then, um, uh, again, it's been very productive for me to work with Dr. Gajala and again, questions of labor, questions of what it means to collaborate um, is something that I've, uh, you know, learned a lot from, uh, from Dr. Gajala's work. Um, and I think in our own way, we've been trying to, you know, um, create spaces or create disruptions even within the academic work that we do. Um, so very recently, uh, a student of Dr. Gajala's, her doctoral student and I, uh, we co-authored an article um, looking at caste-based violence and activism around caste-based violence. And one of the things that both of us tried doing there was to um, cite authors and academics and activists from oppressed caste locations as much as possible. Um, you would think that this should not be such a big deal, uh, but in our work, we've experienced a lot of pushback, uh, even when it comes to something as simple as, um, you know, citing authors who are from oppressed caste locations. Um, and a lot of it has to do with conventions around academic writing as well. So, for example, I've noticed that in my writing, you know, when I've cited uh, blog posts, for example, uh, that have been authored by oppressed caste activists or oppressed caste academics, um, I've been told that those are not good enough sources. Um, so I think together in our work, we've uh, tried sort of disrupting these academic conventions. We've tried disrupting academic conventions that discourage collaborative work, that um, discourage conversations happening as part of um, academic writing. Um, and again, that's been very productive for me. Um, and I think uh, that also is something that I hope to continue doing. Um, yeah, so uh, I think a lot of these questions around uh, labor and collaboration um, and having conversations where we hold each other accountable through the process of academic writing are also questions that we ask uh, in our chapter. So I, I'd love to hear, um, I'd love to hear feedback and questions, um, if any. Thank you so much, Radhika and Sujatha, for your words here. Um, your focus on internet use as a practice of placemaking, specifically in the context of 
Indian digital diaspora and outreach is such an important intervention. Um, and I think it's particularly important because as you articulated in your chapter and as you've just articulated here, we have seen the ways that white feminism often tokenizes upper caste brown feminist work while it is claiming intersectionality, especially within academic settings. And so I think the way that you've really mapped the relationalities and the tensions of, of race and caste, gender, sexuality, and geography within internet publics is really useful for looking at issues that affect Indian women and women of Indian descent across digital South Asian diasporas. Um, and really this point actually you've just made Sujatha about citational pol politics is such a good reminder because who we cite really matters, who we collaborate with and who we show collaboration to really matters. Um, so for example, my students are reading this book this semester for class and the group of students who are presenting on your chapter in my class this Wednesday are so excited about your chapter because they've said they haven't often seen work that um, is about caste as it intersects with feminist activism in their classes. And so they feel really seen by this work. And I think that's another reminder of how who we cite and who we're working with matters for people who are reading the work. Um, so thank you for your important chapter. So this focus on intersectionality and on location is also really key in Dr. Hernandez's chapter. And so I'll pass it over to Milena to introduce Leah to us. Thank you so much, and and thank you, Radhika and Sujata. That was uh, that was a, a really beautiful beginning uh, to today. Um, and now I'd like to introduce uh, Leandra Hernandez, who is an assistant professor of communication and interim academic director of the Center for Social Impact at Utah Valley University. She enjoys teaching health communication, gender studies, and media studies courses. She utilizes Chicana, feminist, and qualitative approaches to explore Latina, Latino, and Latinx cultural health experiences, journalism, and media representations, and also reproductive justice and gendered violence contexts. Her teaching philosophy is informed by social justice approaches, and she's passionate about mentoring undergraduate students through diverse and inclusive research projects. Thank you so much. Yeah, and, and please go ahead. Awesome. Thank you all for this wonderful opportunity. After having worked on this project with everyone for the last few years, it's so nice to be here in a physical slash digital space with you all. So my colleague and co-author, Dr. Sarah de los Santos Upton, couldn't be with us here today, but hopefully I do our conversations justice. So our chapter in the edited volume focuses on the ways in which reproductive justice activists, organizers, and I mean, ultimately supporters talk about reproductive health in online spaces. This particular chapter is part of a larger body of work that Sarah and I have spent the past several years working on. And my colleague, Dr. Sarah de los Santos Upton is an assistant professor at the University of Texas, El Paso. And together she and I operate um, in multiple areas in the communication discipline, mm -hmm. but more specifically at the intersections of health communication media and Latinx communication studies. So over the past several years, I'd say about a decade for now, we've utilized intersectional and feminist approaches to explore reproductive violence and gender violence, particularly for Latina and Latin American women. Um, Sarah and I are both Mexican American. We are both born and raised in Texas, Sarah in El Paso, myself in Houston. So much of our work actually originated in exploring reproductive justice concerns both in Texas more broadly, and then also at the US-Mexico border more specifically. So our first book that came out in 2018 developed the concept of reproductive feminicides, which is a term that Sarah and I developed to explore and interrogate issues of violence against women reproductively that range from lack of access to healthcare to rape and murder in reproductive context. Now, as you could probably guess, and as you may know, 
Um, in response to such violences, reproductive justice organizations and activists have become very present in recent years. And you could probably think about um, the protest Ni Una Mas, which is a larger sort of transnational set of protests over the last several years that have really been pushing back against immigration violence, reproductive control, um, abortion control, and the like. Now, in 2018, Sarah and I explored how news outlets covered and framed such reproductive violence um, protest and efforts. And for this particular book, we wanted to transition to the land of the digital to see how activists, organizations, and supporters were using online spaces to work towards change. So, in this chapter, Sarah and I conducted a textual analysis of different hashtag conversations or assemblies surrounding the hashtags pro-choice, reproductive rights, repro-justice, and reproductive justice. As we color, reproductive justice activists have created a movement that fundamentally redefines terminologies like choice and justice. Um, impacts reproductive justice, activism, and policy, and ultimately considers the transformative nature of intersectional feminist coalition building to inspire change. Now, when Sarah and I are utilizing and engaging with the term reproductive justice, we are drawing upon definitions from Ross, Solinger, um, Zavella, Morgan, and more to think about how reproductive justice interrogates intersections of race, class, nationality, gender, sexuality, and more, thus eclipsing the pro-life, pro-choice binary. And also to think about the role of power and violence here at both a personal and a political level. Now, as Patricia Zavella notes, there are many differences here between the discourse and the idea of reproductive health organizations and those of reproductive justice organizations. And reproductive justice organizations don't only provide reproductive health services, but they also build their bases on organizing by and through women of color. Um, their policy advocacy also utilizes the lens of intersectionality very intentionally. And they work on and focus on culture shifts to really critique negative representations of or discourses about women of color as well. So in this chapter, Sarah and I utilize um, frameworks of intersectionality and reproductive justice to really think about how these concepts, these practices, and these modes of organizing were occurring in the digital spaces as well. So our guiding hashtags, as we mentioned earlier, were pro-choice, reproductive rights, repro-justice, and reproductive justice. And this gave us a short snapshot or a moment in time of the digital archive or the assemblies to see how digital feminisms, according to Taylor, were a means of intervening in the world. And this analysis was largely done um, in 2018, 2019, before the book came out. So for our analysis, Sarah and I were really just looking at what was going on, what's the lay of the land, what do we have going on here? Because as we noted, our earlier research that looked at um, reproductive justice in new spaces found that reproductive justice was largely not mentioned or not alluded to when thinking about these topics, but rather the pro-life, pro-choice binary was really what came to the fore and guided all of the news framing and all of the conversations. So it might not be as surprising that when we're looking at pro-choice, reproductive health and reproductive justice tweets and assemblies, this same kind of disconnect was present in our um, analysis as well. So many reproductive justice activists and organizations focused on reproductive health very broadly. So when they were talking about reproductive health, they were focusing on intersectionality, 
racism, obstetric violence, police brutality, climate change, climate violence, and more. Whereas many of the pro rights and pro choice tweets were focusing mostly on abortion, particularly through the lens of anti abortion legislation in response to pro life or anti choice discourses. Um, what we did not find, however, was much crossover connection or conversation occurring between and among these competing discourses or these competing um, digital tweet assemblies. So in line with much of what we know about um, earlier feminist waves and efforts, the hashtags pro-choice and reproductive rights largely emphasized individual rights to abortion as the primary driving issue, whereas reprojustice and reproductive justice hashtags were utilized more broadly to highlight a spectrum of experiences and a spectrum of activist platforms, not only for birthing individuals, but also for minoritized communities that were subjected to multiple violences. So in our chapter, Sarah and I explore how the continued divides discursively digitally between pro-choice and reproductive justice assemblies is reminiscent of earlier feminist divides across color, race, and gender lines. And um, in our chapter, we also explore some of the implications of this disconnect. Um, we also explored here as well, linking it back to our earlier chapter, how the continued erasure of reproductive justice efforts further contributes to some of these disconnects with reproductive coalition building, outreach, and praxis. Now, as Loretta Ross illustrates so importantly, the term practice is most often used by oppressed groups to change their realities through social justice and with reproductive justice praxis more specifically, um, the activists here are intentionally utilizing intersectionality to call to mind and to the reality, the very real power imbalances that are occurring here in reproductive spaces. So Sarah and I explore how some of these limitations could possibly be occurring, not only in news discourses, but in digital discourses as well. And we also consider how reproductive justice as a digital hashtag assembly not only allows individuals and organizations to voice concerns, but um, in several of the cases in the chapter, we saw that it also facilitates the sharing of information and resources that ultimately engages with and practices um, intersectional activist efforts in ways that the other hashtags did not. So for the chapter, um, I did not include some of the cases in the short talk just in the interest of time, but um, in the q and I'm happy to dive into some of the micro tweet cases a little more just uh, for discussion. Thank you. Leah, thank you so much for sharing about the work that you and Sarah have been doing together. I really appreciate here this reiteration of what reproductive justice actually means and the ways that reproductive relationships, practices, and policies like you've been talking about are all really shaping um, how we come to understand reproductive experiences. I also am really appreciating this focus that you bring on interrogating the binary between pro-choice and pro-life. And it feels really key because like you've discussed, it's really opening up how we can think about reproductive health. It's not just about abortion and reproductive justice is highlighting that there's really a spectrum of experiences. Um, so like one of the things in my class that my students and I were really taken with when we were reading your chapter is also how like this normalization of violence has rendered these statistics of reproductive and gender-based injustices void. And so by that, I mean, 
we've been discussing how affects of apathy really come around um, gender-based violence and numbers suddenly don't seem to have meaning to them anymore. We kind of glaze over when we hear these incredibly high statistics of people who are experiencing gender-based violence. And so what I think you do really well here is articulate how understanding these intersections of race and class and gender help us to transcend that pro-life, pro-choice binary that's often prioritizing white women's experiences like you've discussed, so we can actually better understand and then embrace reproductive justice. So thank you so much for sharing your work with us. To continue um, speaking about how we should be thinking about the intersections of race and technology, we now have Dr. Angela Smith, who Milena will introduce for us. Thank you so much. Uh, Angela Smith is an assistant professor at the School of Information at the University of Texas at Austin. Her current research explores how critical and intersectional theoretical lenses can inform an, an assets-based participatory design of technologies to support historically marginalized groups, such as individuals of color and individuals experiencing homelessness in pursuing sustainable, emancipatory transformations and socially responsible technology experiences. Through qualitative participatory design methods, she seeks to co-construct knowledge, conscientization, my apologies, and design interventions with her populations. Welcome, Angela. Please go ahead. Oh no, thank you so much. That was that was great. I know it was a lot of words. <laughs> no, uh, I'm happy to be here today. And I uh, just like in order to tell you a little bit more about our chapter, I just really want to talk about what motivated that work. Um, so a lot of it, I would say, kind of just struck up from kind of some of my inspirations, I would say. Um, my collaborators aren't here today. So of course, I will give you all of my inspirations as we do talk, but I'm often reminded of uh, William Tierney. Uh, he was the former president of the American Education Research Association. But in his keynote, you know, he talked a little bit about the um, going beyond the ivory tower, the role of the intellectual in eliminating poverty, right? So he wove stories from his youth as a Peace Corps volunteer in Morocco, his days teaching Native Americans on a reservation in North Dakota and his struggles to complete his doctoral dissertation at Stanford uh, to encourage the audience to bear witness to the kids, to listen, take more time to reflect and to argue and defend beliefs around the issues that students in poverty bring to their ability to learn and succeed. Um, so I think a lot about these values and experiences. These are the things that I really try to incorporate in my research in working with communities um, and also my current teachings at UT, which really center around um, social justice and informatics. Uh, but to continue a little bit more specifically in regards to this research, I really do think about my positionality as you know, an African-American within technology, um, often and op operating in a space that's held by you know cis hetero white men and I think about what it's what it's like you know I come from a very interdisciplinary background um, rooted in technology um, and this space of course you know that representation of historically excluded individuals in media and research um, it's prominent um, I call myself also a design researcher because I'm intrigued with studying how we create these tools uh, what attracts us to using technology and how technology can be adapted to those who wouldn't consider themselves technically proficient. Um, I'm also intrigued in design because for me, it merges areas of science, creativity, and psychology of understanding people, talking to people, getting the why behind our interactions in this world behind us. Most recently, I've also taken inspiration from Adrian Marie Brown, um, a la Octavia Butler. Um, if you're unfamiliar, Octavia Butler was a renowned African-American science fiction novelist. Um, Octavia Butler was able to use fiction to imagine and create alternative futures. And Adrian Murray Brown took it a step further, stating that we make fiction that disrupts the status quo. Examining change is a collective bottom up process, centering marginalized communities, and it's neither utopian nor dystopian, and how we need to find this balance between the two. And I think that's why in so many utopian visions of the future, there's still that presence of a threat of another point of attention, but also dystopias leave us with no hope. 
So of course, this is no new phenomenon, um, but I would say that black and brown voices are beginning to echo a little bit louder, right? Um, in 2017, if you happen to live uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, in this neighborhood of East Liberty, uh, Alicia Wormsley, she had these words blown up and displayed um, on a billboard that said, there are black people in the future. And it called attention to the black bodies, families, homes, and histories that are often forgotten in gentrification efforts. This text has become the basis of both protest and collective dreaming to reassure the presence of black people and how we think about the future. One that I strongly believe is starting to find its way into the tech sector. So we've been facing this challenge of inclusion for a while, whether it be related to more inclusive teams among major tech companies, more inclusive research practices, um, when dealing with historically excluded groups or more equitable outcomes. I think about another perspective that Anthony Walton posed back in the late 90s, in which he said there are technological developments in the making that could permanently affect the destiny of Black Americans as Americans and as global citizens. And he spoke about this emergence of technology design, not including Black Americans, although again, we were prominent users of these technologies. What we're seeing today is that again, this onset ultimately has led to the digital divide that we're currently experiencing. So even more, recently, I would say, uh, in 2016, uh, Google did a design census, and we can see there's still a disconnect. Um, taking a look at the current landscape of design, there's only 7% Hispanic representation and 3% Black. And the, the aim of this census, again, was to highlight the lack of diversity across the range of design disciplines. So the lack of representation and inclusion in tech and design spaces leads to design that doesn't consider the needs of all populations, or even that specifies certain groups and is harmful to their existence. Oftentimes these low numbers of technologists and designers in the field and academic spaces means that potential harm to black and brown communities is typically an afterthought. So instead of having someone to say, hey, that's probably not a good idea, or that could turn out badly for people we aren't thinking of, we end up with systems that disproportionately impact certain groups. And as we know um, <clears throat> from a previous publication, traditional methods of design such as user-centered or human-centered design, they've not considered potential system bias, lack of equity and access to digital resources, or more blatantly, racism, sexism, or other forms of oppression. We're seeing firsthand what it means to not have diverse lived experiences in tech and design spaces in the directions of tech and design research, and even as the focus of that research. So I think that brings us a little bit to about this chapter specifically, um, and some of the things that you know we really wanted to highlight, uh, but really in regards to what it looks like to include things like critical race theory within the spaces of activism, um, within the spaces of you know feminist um, activism and feminist HCI. I think it's interesting because you know there's so many, there's so many. What's the word? There's just so many different ways in what activism really looks like, right? Um, so what we wanted to do is take this lens of critical race theory in which we're examining these different tenets of basically how racism is, um, it's not some aberrant thing, it's a persistent um, thing that we see everywhere we're looking. It's, it's embedded into our technologies, it's embedded in theories, it's embedded in really all of our practices and policies a lot of times. Um, but then also taking a look at some of those other theories as well, those other tenets as well, my apologies, talking about liberalism, talking about um, uh, colorblindness, which again is in poor taste, but talking about colorblindness. Um, so all of these things that lead to uh, the thing, and I saw one of the questions in, um, from, the, from, the, from the attendees, and I thought it was great because, you know, nothing about us, you know, without us, right? And, and that's really what this chapter seeks to do is kind of bring that work to the forefront. How do we get on the ground working with these communities to engage them in our research so we can lead to more equitable outcomes, so we can lead to more equitable technologies? So I think I'd really like to consider how we portray Black and Brown communities and the research that we do. So again, when we think about Black and Brown communities in these spaces and in design research, we realize that our research culture really tends to focus on the problems these communities face. Um, again, thinking through terms like marginalized or underserved, 
They're often used in place of naming black and brown communities, causing us to focus on the deficits and disparities that these communities experience. One of the things that we talk about in our chapter is the language that we use. And I also want to highlight that um, Radhika and uh, Sujatha in your chapter as well, you, you, know, you talk about this language that we use, right? So when we're talking about underrepresented and when we're talking about you know, minorities, we're not highlighting the systems that are impacting uh, the ways in which, you know, that have led these individuals to these places. So how do we frame these individuals in more positive spaces? How do we frame them in more positive outlooks? So I think it comes really down to, you know, understanding how we should be centering um, historically excluded individuals in our work. And what does that look like? Um, especially when we're thinking about access to technology, when we're talking about digitized spaces and, you know, network publics, what does that look like? Um, and I think, Again, it kind of comes down to how I like to think, um, how our work challenges the way we think about technology access and really the methods that we use. And this goes into a lot of the methods that I like to use in my own personal research as well. Um, but how it needs to encompass so much more than just physical and sensory accessibility, but also thinking about how inclusive products, spaces, and even design methods are to those with varying um, values and lived experiences. I like to think of April Baker's um, quote as well. If it only includes some of us and not all of us, that's a problem. And I think that's where a lot of this work comes from. Um, when I think how my work has started to grow in the HCI space, it merges interaction design in areas of social justice and informatics. So when we're approaching equity from the lens of interaction design, we position design as a tool to elicit change towards more positive societal outcomes, whether in the ways people are able to access information, the ways people experience tools and digital resources that are meant to support and enhance digital well-being, and the ways that we engage certain communities, particularly those uh, communities in design. So I think a lot when we, you know, when we reflect on this chapter, um, I reflect on not just this, but other works that I've done as well. Um, most notably my work with uh, houseless individuals within the shelter system. Um, but I use a couple of theories there and I just, it's, this is not at all relevant to the chapter, but I just wanna talk about how much this deficit-based thinking um, and the ways that we approach certain communities is built into the practices and the things that we're taught. But I take a look at two different theories information poverty as well as information uh, marginalization. And really it's just how we can't look at one without the other. Information poverty is a, it's a well-known theory within the library information sciences by Elfrida Chapman. And in which she really talks about those individuals who are you know, devoid of uh, information literacy, right? Um, it really takes away the agency from these individuals um, and how they engage in these defensive behaviors. But the issue with this is it puts all the onus on the individual and it really doesn't consider the fact of that they may, ha may not have agency in certain situations. Um, and for me and in my context, it really didn't highlight the fact that, you know, it's not the individual, it's the systems that are fundamentally flawed. So how do we take a little, take a new perspective and take a look at that system and what does that system look like? Um, so through information marginalization, we're able to understand, hey, it's actually the system that's causing people to engage in these defensive behaviors. But you know, what we've learned, I think, from history and what histories continue to tell us is that, you know, systemic barriers are built over time. They tend to be cop-outs, you know, um, as opposed to trying to create solutions that make what make it equitable for all. Let's just engage in these things that are easier and more convenient that we've already been doing. Um, and doing so, we kind of you know eliminate certain individuals throughout this process. Uh, but really, again, there's a need to look holistically at these things. There's a need to look at the individual as well as the system in order to really understand where we can kind of make change. And I think that really comes back to when we're talking about activism and you know feminist uh, HCI and uh, network feminism as well, because I think, again, you can't look at you can't look at one thing without looking at the other. You can't look at equity without looking at history. You can't look at equity without looking at context. You can't look at equity without looking at identity. And as we know, the more intersectional identities that we start to add and layer on, the more difficult things become. We see these individuals with the more intersectional identities, the more and more deeper they kind of go into this oppression that we need to solve for. So I really think what our what our chapter seeks to do is really just push us in our thinking of 
what does it look like to kind of consider, I think, the whole of the individual, um, but what does it look like to really just re-examine, you know, our own practices, our own theories, our own thinkings in order to lead more equitable outcomes? Stop there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Angela, for bringing us through your work. Um, I think like, what you've really shed light on here is the need for more justice-oriented work that does encourage people, like you just said, to really bring their full selves to their community. Um, and also like that need to highlight the systems that are in place that really make it difficult to do that. And that's really important because I think like everyone has been outlining today, like our positions matter, our full selves matter. And then naming the injustices that make it difficult to name ourselves also matter if we actually want inclusion. So this idea of, of scholarly activism in pursuit of racial justice that you've discussed is so pressing, as well as interrogating this deficit-based approach that you were just talking about, um, especially because you are providing this set of tools in your chapter for future scholar activists to use. And you've offered us these calls to action. And that's something that sometimes is missing and that is so key that you've brought forward for us. Um, one of the students actually in my class who's presenting on your chapter next week, they stood after class this morning to talk to me because they did wanna share how they felt really seen by your chapter based on the experiences that they had had as a Black Muslim student. Um, and so they said like for them, it was a permission to embrace themselves and to also be hearing about experiences that sound like theirs reminded them that there are people like them in academics and in technology. Um, and I did ask if I could share those words with you today and they said yes. So thank you again uh, for your work. There's you know, obviously so much to unpack from these three different presentations. And so we'll actually transition now into a discussion period moderated by Michelle in order to do some of that unpacking. Uh, here's a brief reminder that you can add any questions to that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We've got one excellent question in there already that Angela mentioned as well. So again, Angela Radhika, Sujatha, and Leah, thank you for sharing your work. I'm gonna pass it over to Michelle now for the moderated discussion. Uh, thank you, Bree, and thank you all so much. I think these presentations were so rich, as are your chapters, and um, I think you've already started to identify some through lines in this work, and I'm excited to dig in a little bit more um, and kind of start a conversation between the three chapters and presentations. Um, so I'm going to start big um, with a big question. Um, and that is, how do you understand the relationship between activism, feminism, and digital culture within the shifting terrain of the current moment when so much feels in flux? Um, and how do you see that relationship playing out in real time? How do you want us to go? I'm sorry. Anyone can jump in. You you can feel free to start, Angela, if you'd like. I was like, I can start to tackle this. This Thanks. big question. It is a big one. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would say, especially in regards to activism, I think being in academia, it it affords you a unique position. I would say, um, because it's like you know, activism, it can happen through. Our, our writing, right? Just like just like this book, um, activism. You know, it can happen through our research. It can happen through education. Um, I wanted to tackle a little bit about Amy's question, just because, uh, you know, she spoke about the, that quote. It always it stands with me, just because you know we read this paper in both the, in both semesters uh, that I teach. We actually read the, the, this paper, um, but I'm teaching a class currently, Introduction to Social Justice Informatics. We're helping, uh, you know, create build out this this new foundation, this new major at a uh, UT Austin University of Texas at Austin, and um, I I struggle because I worried, really, I worried in building the syllabus and the reading list for these students because one, I was pretty sure like minimal of them would be, you know, black. And then I was like, and then I wondered too, for the students who were white, it's like, well, what do they take from it? It's like, how do they look at these things? What are the perspectives that are going to come out of this? Um, but I was really excited because this was a chance for me to use people's um, 
citations, use people's publications and use people's narratives that weren't, you know, mainstream, that weren't necessarily, you know, that when we think of school and academics, we typically think of those boring, you know, texts written by old white men from like written like a hundred years ago. But this was a chance in which I would actually say I'm pretty sure all of my all of the works comes from individuals of color um, and, you know, different speaking in different contexts. So there's, you know, um, Asian voices, there's Indian voices, there's people experiencing um, uh, who have disabilities, there are people who, you know, come from immigrant contexts. So there's all kind of, you know, voices and perspectives that are really included in it. So it makes me excited because I even think of that as a way of, you know, activism of trying to get people to understand like that the biases and injustices that exist in technology. And then lastly, I would say, um, again, through some of the community based work that I do as well, I think that, you know, therein lies also a way of which we're thinking about activism, right, like trying to get people whose voices are typically not heard, how do we bring that work to the forefront as well. Um, you know, everything can't just be about trendy, sexy algorithms all the time. You know, how do we find space for other for other individuals um, and what does that look like? Um, so, and then when I think of really just adding that feminist perspective to it as well, I think that's, it's really that intersectional layer. I think it really adds this point of, you really can't look at the individual without looking at the, the wholeness of themselves, the fullness of themselves, because they don't occupy just one space, you know, even us here, like, you know, all of us are women, but we have so many much, so many other roles, right? You know, and of course, you know, there's the ones that everyone wants to give you of, you know, mother, daughter, sister, whatever, but it's like, we're more than that. We've got our, you know, our identity roles, we've got, you know, positions that we play, et cetera. So I think all of those things are important. Thank you. I, I saw Radhika and Sujatha nodding when you were talking about citations, and I know that that came up um, in your presentation. So maybe you'd like to go next and address that question. Sujatha, you go. Um, okay, so I'd also uh, like to respond to Amy's question and answering this. Um, and so just to start with a really concrete example of how we've tried to engage with the politics of citation in our work, I want to again go back to the article that I mentioned, uh, which I co-authored with a student of Dr. Gajala's. Um, so the article was looking at uh, how we might articulate visions of justice in response to gender-based violence. And we kind of, um, you know, uh, placed this in the context of India. We, we were looking at conversations around justice that were taking place in India. And what we found was that even though women from oppressed caste communities um, face the worst of gender-based violence, because they also face um, caste-based violence um, in intersection with gender-based violence, um, the perspectives of um, and the protests of oppressed caste women was completely being left out of mainstream feminist scholarship. Um, so even when oppressed caste women's voices were being included, um, like Dr. Smith said, uh, they were being included as victims, but not as uh, people who were raising their voices against these forms of violence or um, as activists or as experts and scholars. Um, so we kind of wanted our article to be an intervention in that regard, um, because also as, uh, you know, as two people who are immersed in online spaces, uh, we saw that there was such rich conversations that, uh, you know, women from oppressed caste communities, activists from oppressed caste communities were contributing to, which wasn't being reflected in feminist scholarship. Um, so in our writing, we kind of, you know, used tweets, um, and, and we frame that as theory uh, and, and not just as like empirical evidence. And, and I think that distinction matters. Um, one of uh, the leading anti-caste scholars in India has pointed out how uh, when it comes to the social sciences in India, um, the upper caste scholars always have um, the distinction of being seen as theorists, whereas people from oppressed caste communities are always reduced to their empirical value, right? Like um, their, their voices matter uh, only as evidence, um, but not as theorists. So we kind of wanted to undo that in our writing. Um, and like I said, like we, we um, included tweets in our writing, we included blog posts in our writing. Um, and what was interesting to us was also uh, looking at how 
um, you know, in the context, in a context where online spaces are being used uh, to articulate uh, protest, uh, are being used to articulate visions of justice, um, there's also been a kind of uh, dismissal of online spaces or, uh, you know, a kind of dismissal of the articulations happening online. Um, one of the, uh, again, I mean, um, a, a leading feminist in India called um, these, these forms of protest happening as fingertip activism, as, as a form of dismissal of the kind of activism that was happening online. So we also kind of wanted to challenge such a framing of activism that happens online as being irrelevant um, and as being inconsequential. Um, so I think that's one of the ways in which we engaged with the politics of citation. But I think when it comes to our chapter, uh, the chapter that Dr. Gajal and uh, I co-wrote with Sarah and Vijeta, um, I think it's also important for me to highlight here that two of us um, actually belong to oppressed caste communities ourselves. Um, so in addition to the politics of citation, I think it's also important to think about who we co-authored with, who are we collaborating with. Um, I'm someone who's still a PhD candidate. And like I said, I come from an oppressed caste community myself. Um, so, you know, for me to find spaces uh, of writing, for me to space uh, find spaces where I can express myself in academic writing, um, those are limited in many ways. So when I, when, Dr. Gajala collaborates with us. Um, I think, she, like I said, like she's creating a disruption um, in not just who gets cited, but who gets seen as an author, who gets seen as an expert, who gets seen as a producer of knowledge. So um, yeah, I think uh, the politics of citation and the politics of authorship um, are both things that we kind of try and bring in um, in how we question who gets to be seen as a legitimate producer of knowledge. Thank you. Radhika, did you want to add anything? Yes, I'll yeah. just quickly follow that. Actually, Angela and Sujata did such a good job that I'm probably going to throw away what I was going to originally say, and you've got my notes a little bit. But I do wanted to point to the fact that in terms of uh, what both of them men mentioned, I see that in the, I don't see that academics are activists in the same way as people are on the protest uh, communities and uh, and even the labor of the call out culture, call out uh, activists on on social media. So I do want to preface this. Uh, but that's why I always have this conversation, even with my graduate student advisees, that I would be very careful about calling uh, myself as an activist. What, what I do think is this is part of my duty as, a, as, a, as an educator is to find the places where people aren't being heard, if it's at all possible, because when I, I myself might be blocking them from speaking by my very existence. And so I want to put that out there and say that then I want to say that if there is any kind of activism to be done through academia in relation to online spaces, it's it's kind of like what Angela is doing, what 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 all of you others are doing in terms of both methodology. Leandra pointed to so much in terms of how to unravel this, these spaces. Um, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot to be done in terms of citational practices, but also in terms of methodology. So wherever our location is from, if we're doing the same flattened epistemic conditions of production, we're doing a, pro we're doing a disservice to how knowledge is formed. So I see my space as constantly critiquing methodology and I have to get to the next thing that the mainstream users are using, which I think uh, both Leandra and Al Angela as well emphasized is doing, uh, getting into the algorithm, and so to speak. So I also want to point out at the other end of uh, um, um, activism is the fact that uh, a lot of what's going on in online spaces is already pre-framed by the discourse of what Sydney Tarot would call the contentious politics. Um, and so in that space, then the work we do as researchers needs to unpack and be accountable to the labor of the activists because all we get is a bunch of uh, uh, pre-framed contentious stuff out there that the users are left with trying to make sense in our everyday. I mean, the everyday stress of even encountering news on social media itself creates a lot of confusion. 
Um, and the other part, thing I wanna highlight is the fact that the, there is a commodification of feminist politics that we need to be careful about. And that's, that's why intersectional work gets gentrified to use the words coming also from discussions from the same, I think, special issue that Sujata is talking about, where we are doing a dialogue piece as well. Um, and, and, and so I see my work as a uh, fairly um, older scholar <laughs> in both age and in time spent in academia, uh, which surprises me uh, that I've spent so much time, uh, is actually to mediate these spaces. And, uh, and one of my roles has been to work with uh, the Fembot Collective and uh, Carol Stabile, my co-editor, and, and who, who was the founder of Fembot Collective. Uh, we, 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 our uh, tactics have been, I would say, guerrilla tactics in, in a lot of way in trying to say, okay, these are the voices that need to be heard, how to make, make it make these people do it, but there's a precondition to being heard either in uh, social media spaces or in a, any general academic spaces. And the precondition is access to um, and education and uh, access to the informational literacy and uh, access to technology. So I'll stop with that. Thank you. And, and Leah, maybe you want to jump in with your thoughts. Um, yeah, sure. Things. So I really love um, all of these questions and ongoing conversations that we're having about speaking, who gets the chance to speak, and also who is um, a legitimate activist or not, which is a debate that we have in our um, social media spaces and academic spaces all the time. Um, going back to the idea about um, method and activism, this was also something that came up quite a bit for Sarah and me and our book editors. You probably remember the conversations we had, right? When we were talking about and thinking through how to cite the tweets, whether or not to include names and how to go about that, particularly when thinking about tweets that were coming from well-known organizations like uh, California Latinas for Reproductive Justice versus tweets that were coming from individuals on... Um, perhaps their personal accounts that were public, right? So something that Sarah and I are always concerned about in these research spaces is the possibility of doxing or our own research topics or participants who are included getting attacked once research gets out there and then people read it and then are attuned to finding information about these tweets or these individuals that they might not have known existed. Um, so that's why for this particular chapter, Sarah and I decided that we would go forth with utilizing the names of the organizations, um, particularly because their accounts were public and well known and the organizations themselves are well known, um, like Planned Parenthood, for example, right? But we really struggled with whether or not to include the names of individuals, particularly when we were talking about the reproductive justice tweet assemblies and um, individuals not affiliated with organizations who are posting information about like immigration detention, um, violence against transgender migrants at the border and the like. And granted, um, in full transparency, this is one of the first pieces Sarah and I co-wrote together where we utilize social media spaces as our main area of inquiry. Um, so that's a conversation we are still continually having um, together about the methods, particularly because um, with one case, for example, in the reproductive justice tweet assembly, um, there were individuals who were Latinx or Latin American identified who were talking about immigration, detention, reproductive justice and barriers and things of that nature. Um, also linked to other conversations about reproductive oppression and injustice at the border and the like. And even when we were writing up the pieces, Sarah and I struggled with how to think through the framing of it, kind of meta framing at a level, right? Um, but also to think through the, the naming of the participants as well. So Amy, I see your comment here about um, the obscurity and the ethics of citation. So I really appreciate you bringing that in because I feel like we could have a whole other um, webinar just on that, right? So probably more, more questions than answers, but again, um, something that Sarah and I are constantly thinking about as well. Thank you. Um, before I hand it over to Milena, um, 
I, I have a burning question for all of you. And um, I think it's connected um, to some of what you've talked about, Sujatha, talking about co-authoring um, and talking about methods. So um, each, of the each of your chapters in the collection um, is co-authored. And I was struck by your different approaches to co-authorship. So Radhika and Sujatha, you and your two other co-authors write about, um, quote, working in dialogue to theorize with each other in the production of the chapter. Um, Angela, your chapter interweaves personal stories um, from you and your co-authors in block quotations to what um, you, you explain, quote, for, further deeply illustrate your experiences. Um, and Leah, you and Sarah use a collective we um, in writing together. Um, so I wondered if you could each just tell us kind of very briefly about your process of co-authoring and how this might fit within a feminist approach to scholarship. Maybe we'll start with Leah this time if you, yeah, if you've got. Yeah, um, so Sarah and I are actually developing a manuscript right now on a concept called comadrisma, which in Spanish comadre is like a godmother or um, a woman who is an important family friend or family collaborator who may not be related to you biologically. And the entire idea of comadrisma is hinged upon feminist collaboration, co-editing and co-writing because we have a, um, a small community of women scholars in Latino comp studies where we co-edit books together, we co-author together, we co-present together. Um, and it's a way of helping all of us move toward tenure as we have rotating authorship lines, but we also have kind of developed this larger group research agenda that brings together all of our shared interest in um, rhetoric, border studies, and Chicana feminisms. So for Sarah and me, we've co-edited, we've written one book together, co-edited one book, and probably have over 10 to 15 chapters and articles that we've co-authored together. So I think for us being very close friends and also close colleagues, we've never even considered separating our writing unless we're actually writing a piece where it's like a separate autoethnography and then we bring it all together at the end. Um, and I think for us, given our very similar positionalities as um, queer Latinas who are both born and raised in Texas, it's also very easy for us to kind of fuse our personal identities and our academic identities and everything we write anyways. Um, so yeah, just thinking about that now that I reflect on it, I'm like, oh yeah, we've never used an I separately unless we had to. So it, it's always been a very seamless process for us, I guess, over like the last five or six years. I find sometimes in those processes, it becomes even difficult to remember what you wrote and what your co-author wrote um, on the Google Doc. Um, <laughs> Angela, do you have, uh, would you like to share a bit about your thoughts on co-authoring? Yeah, I mean, I would say, honestly, for us, it's been a really organic process. Um, I think, and I think that's what I've appreciated most. Like, I feel like it hasn't been very effort. I think I always have fears going in of co-authoring just because um, I always think of that hated group project in school where, you know, there's one person doing everything and then everyone, you know, like then there's that one person that's like doing nothing. So I think I had that fear of that. But I do think, and I think it's one of the things too, when we talk about ways in which we can bring, um, bring other people up, you know, kind of elevate other voices, it's really kind of that chance to do so through co-authorship right when you're talking about you know people who are like very much like well known or how do we bring up these um people who are just coming from those those new voices and those new perspectives and just backgrounds that we don't see a lot like i think co-authorship is the way to do it right co-authorship is the way to get them one the experience but also the exposure um to kind of to really find those successes on their own so i would say i've definitely been fortunate in that in that way um and I think kind of especially once we, you know, once we start to get to those those uh, positions of seniority, um, that's when we can definitely think about, you know, how can I bring up others around me? Thank you. Um, Radhika and Sujatha, do you have anything to add to, to that aspect of the conversation? I'll let Sujatha go first. 
Um, so I think with Dr. Gajala, I think we've been in constant conversation from 2015 at least. Um, I was a master's student then and I was writing my first article looking at um, activism in online spaces and I sent a cold email to Dr. Gajala and not only did she respond, she's been mentoring me since then. And um, I think our conversations are constant. Um, I've seen that we both, you know, even in our personal social media use, when we see uh, that the other person has posted something interesting, um, you know, we'll message each other, we'll talk about it. And invariably those conversations uh, find their way into our writing. And again, like Dr. Gajala plays a big role in telling, telling us, her students that, you know, that, okay, like these are very important points you're making. And I think this needs to go into writing. Um, so our, I feel like our, our journey of co-authoring has been constant for the last seven years, which again is not an experience I've had elsewhere. But I, I also uh, think what Dr. Smith said about um, using your institutional position to create spaces for others is so important. And I think I really value that um, as a young scholar. I also think that it, in addition to providing exposure to people who are maybe uh, more junior to you, are junior scholars, I think the process of co-authoring can also um, be about the sharing of risk. Um, I think especially if we are writing about issues that uh, are not very amenable to academia, especially, um, how can a person who is who has a more sort of stable position um, within that institutional space ensure that they share the risk of someone who doesn't have the same space and, and how can the process of co-authoring help with that? Um, and again, that's something I want to think more deeply about. Um, and, and I think there's a great question about solidarity as methodology. Um, so I also want to think about how the process of co-authorship um, is an instance of enacting solidarity through methodology and, and specifically um, the sharing of risk as a part of solidarity and, and how that can be woven into uh, the processes of co-authoring, I think. Wow, thank you. That's some great, great insight to add. Um, Radhika, is there anything you'd like to add to, to that? Yes, I mean, I, what would I add? Everybody's been brilliant in what they've said. Uh, I just want to say from my location, that uh, first of all, I can't I get bored if I'm trying to write alone uh, and that's basically, but I appreciate Sujata saying what she said and I appreciate the rest of you uh, unpacking the co-authorship. Um, I just need to talk to people. I need to keep learning. Um, and as far as sharing of the risk is concerned, I think that's also, but I, I worry on the other end of uh, the appropriation. I'm always worrying that I'm appropriating. So whenever possible, especially because I uh, look at these online public spaces and my very first project as uh, my dissertation project started with people pushing back at me for studying them. So it taught me a few lessons about what it means um, to, and now to gain your own voice in the midst of people either trying to believe you to not write about them or either legitimately uh, feeling victimized and appropriated by what you do. So for me, it's a constant, uh, constant, um, I would say verification sounds uh, lame, but it is a constant checking back with people that uh, I am, I'm writing about the context and also asking them if they're comfortable being part of this uh, uh, public writing. If they're not comfortable, they do, they do contribute. And we, we also don't always acknowledge them because as, I said, as uh, Sujata said, it's about spreading of the risk. And if people feel like um, you know, they can't be uh, highlighted, but on the other hand, there will be people who turn around and uh, feel like I have only mentored the upper caste, um, um, you know, um, US educated uh, graduate student, uh, because that's the person often that I have access to. So I'm very grateful to people like Sujata and Vijeta who actually allowed me to connect with them and allowed me to have them publicly spoken because the other side of all this is that it's also could also co-authoring could also be considered appropriation. So. Thank you. That was such a nuanced discussion, and I'm so inspired by by some of what you've said about co-authorship. 
Um, I could go on forever, but I, I'm cognizant of the fact that the chat and Q&A are burning up. So I'm gonna hand it over to Milena to moderate this aspect. Thanks so much. And uh, and uh, yeah, it, it uh, there's so many great questions and, and my apologies ahead of time if I don't, we don't get to everyone's. Um, and, and I wanted to start off um, also, also really thanking all of you for um, for the conversation around visibility and authorship and and and, and co-creation. Um, one of the projects I'm involved in is is working through creating an archive of disaster survivor stories. And we're asking a lot of questions around what it means to shift journalism and design practice from a sort of sources or participants and towards sort of uh, collaboration models and co-creation models. Um, and, and one of the things that I hadn't thought about uh, that, thank you again for this, is what it means to see yourself in digital spaces. You know, how much it means to me when I am a co-author and I get to Google my name and I get to see my name pop up as, as attached to a piece of work, a piece of record, right? That I become a history and what it means when we remove those opportunities, reduce those opportunities. So I, I, I really appreciate this, but not about me. I have a question from uh, from our uh, our uh, participants <laughs> here uh, um, for, and I'll start with Leah here. Um, Leah's here, yeah, there she is. Okay, I see Leah. Your chapter uh, makes a compelling case for using reproductive justice as a framework for activism and scholarship as a way to avoid some of the oversights of the pro-choice movement, like you said, especially when it comes to the experiences of women of color. You also show how using your productive justice framework within digital activism may resist the co-option of pro-choice by pro-life advocates online. Uh, as Roe versus Wade is seriously threatened in the US uh, right now, and we're seeing some of that in Canada, uh, uh, that kind of uh, push uh, as well. Um, and pro-choice issues continue to be debated uh, in news and online. How are you seeing these two different approaches playing out online and how do we, ensure, how do we um, work towards uh, the reproductive justice being centered within these conversations? Do we have an extra hour? No, seriously though. Um, I, I love that question, particularly because as I mentioned earlier, I'm born and raised in Texas and I love my home state, but the politics make me wanna vomit sometimes, particularly when we're seeing not only um, attacks against abortion and Roe v. Wade on a national scale, but also the smaller state politics attacking um, transgender children, LGBTQIA plus children and the like. So in response to the first question, and I'll be brief because I want us to have more time for Q&A, um, I'm still seeing the, the same trends occurring, right? We're largely, um, the reproductive rights and pro-choice discourses are still focusing on um, Roe v. Wade and those sorts of attacks, but the reproductive justice organizations, activists and supporters are largely talking about abortion and reproductive rights within these larger contexts. So I'm seeing a lot of tweets and a lot of resharing of news articles, not only about abortion and re Roe v. Wade, but also about um, like in Texas, for example, supporting transgender children and their rights to bodily autonomy and safety and support. Um, now, when it comes to the second question in terms of how we ensure that reproductive justice is centered in these conversations, I think it's largely incumbent upon us as social media users, activists, and or academics, however we identify ourselves, to um, share the good word, right? This is something that I'm talking about in all of my classes with my students, not only in our feminist health communication spaces, but also our trauma-informed journalism students as well, particularly when we're thinking about the discourses that are predominantly shared and viewed and what doesn't get brought to the fore, either because of the news framing or the algorithms at play. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Um, I've been really quite, this is not my question, but I've been burning here. 
wanting to ask Angela a question. So this this might be unfortunate, the last one. I'm sorry, but I that's, that's Angela. Uh, so and this comes from our audience. Uh, I think design is the enactment of value as the affordance of some possibilities to some people, and I think of it as well as the process by which some subjects understand themselves to be hailed by a site or service and others understand themselves as outsiders unwelcome. I would love to hear some examples from your work, Angela, that describe how systems and interfaces co-produce marginalization. This was a great question I saw when it came in and I was like, oh man, she's asking a doozy. Um, but no, I think I think about this question a lot, especially in my work with uh, houseless individuals. Um, I even think most recently uh, during like, of, I say during like the COVID pandemic, although it's like like it ended, but it's it hasn't ended. But um, most recently, I feel like a couple months ago, uh, you know, VP Kamala Harris, uh, she mentioned something about like, you know, like uh, looking if like talking about looking for information, just go Google it, which is great for like, you know, us right now, like, oh, okay, go Google something, that's fine. But then I think of um, individuals experiencing uh, houselessness and like one, like uh, there's tons of research that'll tell you like they have access to, you know, devices and Wi-Fi kind of at the same rates um, as their more stable peers. So I think that's, you know, that's that's not necessarily the issue, but when we're talking about literacy, right, and finding information that's relevant to them. So when you're talking about like go find, you know, <laughs> go search for something um, in regards to like whether it's, you know, one, how to get a stimulus check right? Um, something like that, or, you know, how to check on the status of your stimulus check, um, things like that. There's not really access for it. There's not, like, how do you Google that? And then it's like, one, how do we know that the information that's being um, displayed is really of use or of service to them? And that's actually something um, another colleague and I, we've been going back and forth with and, you know, wondering, like, is it worth developing a study there? Because I don't even think, because um, one of the big overarching questions um, that I've, I've kind of talked about, um, in regards to like my overall research agenda is uh, how are systems and how are interfaces, you know, perpetuating marginalization, right? And I think that's one um, when we're talking about, uh, especially when you think of things like search engine optimization and we're talking about the rankings that exist there, you know, just like uh, Leah was mentioning and you're talking about um, even like the sponsored things that kind of make it to the top of the list there. How do we even know that information is relevant or useful? So I think that's that's a key interface that I go back and forth daily on of whether or not, uh, not of whether or not, of how that is producing marginalization, just because the people who need information are, are they even getting adequate information? Um, how, you know, like, I don't think that's the case. And there's tons of studies too, um, in which we're talking about basically how people search for things and how um, people who have more domain expertise, you know, have much more successful searches because their searches are more specific, right? So again, like the search, the problem with the search engines, the search queries, that's one big, one big ball of, one big ball of issues that needs to be really just kind of netted through. Um, and then I think when I think of other systems and interfaces, I, I, I think there's, there's a good amount too. Like, so when I think of to kind of just uh, what Leah was mentioning, even when I think of just the, the social media platforms that we're using nowadays and all the algorithm driven ones, like the TikToks of the world, the Instagrams and things like that, all the hashtags that we're using. And then when you think of another conversation I was having, I have tons of conversations apparently, but another conversation I was having, um, when you think of, there was a big, uh, there was a big like not ban, but protests via social media that happened either last year or the year before. Again, time is a blur with the pandemic, but um, it was about black content creators and how they're not getting the credit or the same shine to their work as their white counterparts. And, you know, again, that's due to the algorithms, right? Um, so there was a big protest going on talking about that um, and how, you know, doing so to kind of, you know, bring that awareness too. And it's one of the things that I think about is, you know, what is happening there within the algorithms and the platforms? And again, algorithms isn't really my space, but what's happening there when you're talking about systems um, that is continuing that marginalization because you're continuing to push that group to the outside, them on the outside when they are great, you know, contributors of content. And then even when you think of kind of everything that's going on with uh, within and I would say outside of the trans community and how that's handled, um, there's a lot of research going on in terms of content moderation, right? Um, and a lot of individuals who get, you know, uh, 
accounts suspended, you know, post deleted, um, I don't know, shadow boxed, all those things, it happens to be, you know, persons of color as well as, you know, individuals within the LGBTQ communities. So again, when you're talking about uh, individuals and in experiencing marginalization through these systems and these interfaces, it tends to be the same individuals, um, right? And I think, again, it begs that, that question of why aren't we including these individuals, you know, in the design of these tools, um, especially as, you know, these tools are becoming, they're taking off much quicker than anything, anything has in the past. So I think that's, that would be the key area there. I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of examples um, that take place. And I think that's why it's important to kind of really look at the system. Um, but I think also too, there's that educational component when we're talking about, especially trying to help people from, you know, lower SES, um, or just people who are just trying to navigate the internet as a whole, how do we teach them how to successfully kind of navigate these spaces? Because, you know, Unfortunately, I don't I don't see people uh, like the TikToks of the world changing their algorithms anytime soon. Um, so how do we teach them to kind of navigate these spaces safely? Uh, because a lot of them, when they are engaging or looking for information or making posts um, for their own identities, they're putting themselves in in harm's way sometimes. So how do we, you know, give them the the tools and the resources to really kind of safely do this um, and just you know continue to empower them in doing so? Thank you so much for that, Angela. Really appreciate it. And, and I, I will now hand it over back to Bree uh, for our uh, final, some final thoughts. And again, thank you so much uh, for everybody's, everyone's answers and these beautiful questions that came through. I wish we could continue speaking all day. I know we cannot, but this was incredible. Thank you so much to our speakers for your insights and for sharing your experiences and your work with us. I was honestly nodding my head like this the whole time as you were speaking. And I wanted to just be like, yes, thank you. I really want more spaces where we can talk about these ideas. Um, so something that is in the works right now is a future symposium on solidarity as method. So let's stay in touch for this because I think we have lots to continue talking about. Um, authorship and collaboration and co-design being a few of those things. I will wrap it up now and say thank you as well to you, our audience, for your questions and for your willingness to be here with us today. I really appreciate the comments and the questions that were coming in, and it definitely makes for a more collaborative space and helps to make it feel more intimate. So thank you so much. As we now conclude this Networked Feminism speaker series, I do want to reflect very briefly because I know we're over time, um, but just on the ethos of this speaker series that we touched on during that first session back in January. I think the spirit of this talk was really centered around collaborative knowledge sharing um, and community building and trying to challenge the dominant ideologies of the academy. And I think that particularly within this moment of kind of collective exhaustion, and widespread injustice, one way that we can push back at that often uh, competitive individualist impulse that is upheld by the academy is to create these spaces of collaborative relational knowledge sharing. Even if it's just for an hour or two like now, this can give us the kinds of support and the connections needed to keep pushing, to keep questioning, and to keep celebrating and highlighting that which is resisting right now. So thank you again so much, everybody, for being here with us. We hope you enjoyed your time with us over the last three months. We hope you enjoyed your time with us today. And we really hope to connect with all of you again sometime in the future. So be well, stay in touch, and take care, everybody. Thank Bye, y'all.